Hello friends, Sabrina here. If you are new to the podcast, welcome. Today's episode is an especially good one for new listeners as well as established friends. So, so much of what I typically share with you on the podcast focuses on personal stories. The stories of people who are incarcerated. The stories of people like me, compassionate friends on the outside of the razor wire. The stories of daily life in a particular prison. The stories of individuals or teams on the outside who choose to adopt a prison and offer care. And all of those stories are true. But there is a much larger picture as well. There's a grander scale on which there is a need for care in prison neighborhoods. And recently it came to my attention that I haven't shared in depth about that larger scale yet here on the podcast. I was having coffee with a friend, someone newer to prison care, and he asked me this question. Sabrina, you talk with such confidence about the fact that the time is now for prison care, that the pieces are in place for prison care to make a powerful impact. Why? Why are you so sure that this is such an important time? I answered him with what I'm going to now share with you. And he listened intently. And when I was finished, he said, okay, I get it now. You're right. Wow. This is the moment. So today I want to cast a little vision for the big picture for what prison care is more fully here for long term and for why you and every other compassionate person who is listening will agree that there is an urgent need that we must help meet. The stakes are high. The need is urgent. The time is now. I often say that if one person receiving care from the outside doesn't count, well, then we're doing the math wrong. And I stand by that belief and I will continue to say it over and over. Each letter I write as a pen pal encourager is worth every minute it took to write and every bit of emotional energy it required. Everyone on the inside matters. One prison neighborhood adopted by one compassion team or even adopted by one person is filled with individuals whose lives can be impacted for the better by the support of a more positive culture inside their facility. Encouragement in the form of relationships through letters, resources in the form of mental wellness information to improve health, inspiration in the form of virtues-based language that models and coaches people on the inside to live with respect for themselves and others, regardless of the uniform anyone wears. Each individual matters. But at the same time, most of us outside the system are oblivious to the looming problem in our nation's prison system as a whole and unaware of the urgent need for prison care at this moment in history. Simply put, the type of prison system the United States has been perpetuating for the last 100 plus years doesn't work because it isn't sustainable. Let that sink in for a minute, especially if you're afraid that I'm gonna talk about abolition now or early release for drug offenders or some other partisan issue, because that is not where I'm going. I'm not saying it doesn't work because prisons are fundamentally a bad approach and should be abolished. I'm not saying it doesn't work because too many people are incarcerated, period, and many of them should be released. I'm not saying it doesn't work because they are not offering rehabilitative opportunities that will reduce recidivism. There is a great deal of truth to be explored in all of those partisan ideas, but that is not for today's episode. In general, that's not for prison care to explore at all. So let me say it again so that we are very clear. The type of prison system the United States has been perpetuating for the last 100 plus years doesn't work because it isn't sustainable. It isn't sustainable. The fact that it's made it this long does not mean it can keep going indefinitely. It's approaching its terminus. The U.S. prison system is not sustainable. There are wonderful references you can explore if you like data, pie charts and graphs and stats, Bureau of Justice Statistics at bjs.ojp.gov collects all sorts of information from all over the country every year, prisonpolicy.org and the Marshall Project and the Sentencing Project are organizations providing excellent research resources 
and I will drop links into the show notes for you. But I'm an average person speaking about the practical that I observe and I'm learning to make sense of. So I will leave it to you to do your homework if you want the data for your own analysis and evaluation. Simply put, the US incarcerates a lot of people. There were close to 2 million individuals in jails, prisons, juvenile and immigration facilities in 2022. The US is the most highly incarcerated country in the world. Those prisons require corrections professionals to run them. If you lock people up, you have to provide for their custody, care, and control. And that's what correctional officers, case managers, and prison administrators are paid to do. The more people you have serving prison sentences, the more correction staff you need to provide custody, care, and control. I'm terrible at word problems and math, but even I understand that the more prisoners the more prison staff you need, right? And herein lies the problem. The workplace environment is so toxic inside a prison that it is becoming more and more difficult to recruit and retain correctional officers. Recruitment is a tough sell because corrections is a tough field. You can talk up the positive elements all day long and you will still come away convinced that it's a tough field to work in. So getting people to choose this tough field requires perks to make it attractive. Things like high salaries, excellent benefits, opportunities for advancement, elite leadership from supervisors, five weeks paid vacation a year, rich continuing education opportunities, etc. Well, corrections includes almost none of these attractive perks. The national average for CO pay in 2022 was $48,000 a year. You can raise a family on that salary, especially since many of the CO jobs are in state Department of Corrections facilities, so the health benefits are good. It's not a salary to be looked down upon, but put it up against other jobs that make a similar salary without a college degree. According to Stats from the Bureau of Labor Statistics for 2022. Reliable source, right? 48,000. You can make that in fields like the top tiers of retail management, manufacturing positions that often offer on-the-job training, skilled trades for which training is often affordable, sanitation supervision in commercial facilities, and for the entrepreneurial types with some computer savvy, digital marketing or online transcription. That's just a small sampling. Now, the benefits are not likely as good in those positions. But think about the trade-off, the decrease in danger alone. Correctional officers walk into every single shift with a legitimate threat of bodily harm. And on the shifts where they are not jumped, they are exposed to violence by one prison inmate against another to the witnessing of self-harm by people who are incarcerated and failing mentally, by overt hatred from many of the 100 plus incarcerated people surrounding them on the tier, the throwing of bodily fluids at them in protest against prison conditions, and more. To make it worse, those other benefits that we would hope for in a job this tough are very hard to find. As far as elite leadership goes, prison administration is notoriously unsupportive of CO's needs and requests. And my apologies to the awesome wardens and AWs out there, because some of you are running facilities and are tremendously supportive of your CO's needs and requests. But let's face it, industry-wide, administration is known for being unsupportive. Time off for family, for travel, for personal interests is hugely problematic. You not only don't get that five weeks paid vacation every year, you work shifts with unpredictable long hours and frequent mandatory overtime. How about moving up in the corporation? Yeah, there are opportunities for advancement, but none of them are gonna remove you from the toxic environment of your workplace. You'll still be in the prison environment, which is at the heart of this tough, tough situation. You'll still be in the prison environment, which at, 
Moving up in the corporation, there are opportunities for advancement, but none of them remove you from the toxic environment of your workplace. You will still be in the prison environment, which is at the heart of this tough situation. Racial tensions within prisons can be tremendously challenging. With people of color currently being incarcerated at five times the rate of white people, and with almost 60% of correctional officers in the US being white, and with many prisons being built in rural areas away from racially diverse cities, you can imagine that racial tension often runs high. Continuing education is spotty at best. Heck, the initial education you get in the Corrections Academy at the time of your hire is on average only eight to 12 weeks long, with some states offering a terrifyingly short two or three weeks of training before you are moved into the facility to learn on the job. But let's imagine that someone feels drawn to work in corrections, wants to be in a profession that serves society, likes the idea of challenge. They're successfully recruited and they now fill a needed position in a prison. Excellent. Now you just have to keep them around. Ugh, retention of correctional officers is approaching crisis status in the US. Let me give you this for context. In 2000, 23 years ago, a study found that the turnover rate in corrections was what experts called alarmingly high at 16%. That means that 16% of the staff in a facility on average was leaving within a year and new recruits were being brought in and trained to take their places. 16% of your staff at any given time would therefore be inexperienced. That was an alarmingly high 16% turnover rate in 2000. In 2022, the turnover rate on average was 30%. 30% of correctional officers are leaving quitting or retiring, and new recruits must be found and trained to take their places. In some prisons, it's much higher than that. In one private prison I studied in 2021, their turnover rate was 107%. Think about that for a moment. The staff bearing the responsibility for the custody, care, and control of approximately 1,800 prison residents was experiencing a 107% turnover rate that year. Many prisons are now reporting vacancy rates as high as 50%. And that's not vacancies among the resident population, that's staff vacancies. That means they're running with half the staff they need. The Bureau of Labor Statistics predicts that in the US there will be a need to hire 33,000 correctional officers each year for the next 10 years. Why aren't people eager to spend their whole career in corrections? 10 years ago or so, a new term was coined that explains it. Corrections fatigue. Corrections fatigue refers to the post-traumatic stress type symptoms that correctional officers almost universally experience after only a short time on the job. Hypervigilance, trouble sleeping, intrusive, unpleasant thoughts or memories panic attacks, emotional numbness, feelings of helplessness, difficulty controlling anger. Desert Waters, a brilliant nonprofit organization out of Colorado under the direction of Dr. Katarina Spinaris, defines corrections fatigue as cumulative negative changes of corrections staff's personality, health, and functioning, and of the corrections workplace culture a cumulative negative change of correction staff's personality, health, and functioning, and of the corrections workplace culture. Another brilliant organization, One Voice United, is bringing correctional officers together to speak the truth and to have each other six while they do it, educating our nation's legislators and the world at large about the realities of a life spent working in corrections. Again, links are in the show notes to these organizations so that you can learn more about their tremendous work. The reason retention is a problem for corrections officers is because of what the job, 
the environment in the workplace, as well as the specific dangers associated with their work, makes them sick physically, mentally, emotionally, and relationally. The average life expectancy for someone who spends their career as a CEO is, wait for it, 59 years old. Friends, 77 years old is the national average for people who do not work in corrections. Do you think that the new recruits sign a document at hiring agreeing to trade 18 years of their life for the job? On average, correctional officers who work their whole career as COs and then retire will live for only 18 more months after retirement. Can you imagine that? Some die from unmanaged physical conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, or stroke. Sadly, some die from suicide. In fact, a staggering number of COs currently employed or retired from the field are victims of suicide. The divorce rate among COs is terrible, as is the rate of alcoholism. When they say that corrections is a tough job, they are not kidding. Okay, so pull the focus back out a little wider again. In light of the tremendous challenge we find in recruiting and retaining correctional officers and the high number of people who are incarcerated serving prison sentences, a serious problem becomes evident. If 23 years ago a 16% turnover rate was alarmingly high, what should we wisely expect to happen in the next 10 years when the 2022 average turnover rate was 30% or higher? This system is not sustainable. There are soon not going to be enough staff to provide custody, care, and control for the people who are incarcerated. There are facilities operating at half staff, which to my mind means there are already not enough staff to provide custody, care, and control for the residents on the tiers. And what are we doing as a society when we insist on perpetuating, propping up and continuing within a system that is literally eating away the lives of the people willing to work in it. 18 years worth of life expectancy being taken. So let's bring it around to prison care. The need is clearly an urgent one. The prison system in the US is not sustainable. It must change and it must change soon. Advocacy groups are working hard in Washington to make the changes at the legislative level. And I hope and pray that they are successful in finding specific solutions. But why do I think that prison care and a bunch of pen pal encouragers are a vital piece of the answer to this looming crisis in our prison system nationally? Because equipping pen pal encouragers is not the only thing that prison care does. That's how we started. That's how I started. And that's been the heart of the prison care podcast to this point because it seemed to us that this was a great way to educate and raise up compassionate people who want to be a part of positive change, but don't want to go inside the fence. A podcast is a great way to reach people like that, offering them tools and knowledge that helps them get involved. But Prison Care Incorporated is more broadly committed to raising awareness of the urgent need for a new system. And here's the core of it. Equipping the next generation of policymakers corrections professionals, criminal justice practitioners, and law enforcement to catch the vision for a prison system that is not entrenched in an us versus them mindset. That's the core of the prison care model for advocacy, right? We are not advocating for prisoners at the expense of corrections staff, and we're not advocating for the staff at the expense of the residents. We see a prison as a neighborhood in which every person is suffering because of the toxic environment our approach to corrections in the US has created over the last century. We believe in a fundamental change in paradigm. No more us versus them, no zero sum game. One group does not have to lose for the other to win. While there are obvious distinct differences in the goals of prison residents and the goals of prison staff members, 
there are also shared goals. Let me say it again. There are shared goals. For example, residents and staff alike want to be safe from violence. COs and inmates both want to experience physical health. People wearing both kinds of uniform want to be mentally well and experiencing personal growth and fulfillment. All of the residents of the prison neighborhood, whether they are there voluntarily or not, want provision that will meet their needs. Prison residents and prison staff members have shared goals. Okay, so what are we doing about it? What is Prison Care Incorporated doing about it? How are we casting vision with the next generation of policy shapers? Well, part of what Prison Care is doing connects us with universities with student groups and with faculty, casting a vision for the development of a prison system model that is not based on us versus them. We're not offering the framework for the model itself. That is beyond the understanding and expertise that any of us here at Prison Care have. But we want the folks who do have greater understanding and expertise, who will be the voices and hands creating the new system that will replace this soon to be obsolete prison system over the next few years. We want them to become convinced that us versus them is not serving anyone. It is the fundamental toxic element that must be removed. It is killing everyone inside a prison neighborhood. So I hope that you, like my friend at coffee the other day, are nodding your head a light in your eyes and you're saying, okay, I get it now, you're right, wow, this is the moment. I hope that you are thinking about the scope of the problem and the heart of the solution. Oh, I wish I had all of the specifics for that solution figured out, all neat and tidy on paper, wrapped up with a bow, ready to present to Congress, but I don't have a clue. I don't have a criminal justice degree. I don't have a wealth of experience in sociology or years of observation inside the corrections industry. What I have is a fundamental truth to share, one that must guide the folks with all that knowledge and experience that is not mine to offer. When we create a new system, it must be one that recognizes the shared goals and needs of everyone inside a prison neighborhood. It cannot be set up on an us versus them principle. If our society must have prisons, they must be designed for the improvement, support, and rehabilitation of the people who are incarcerated there. And they must be designed for the support, encouragement, and well-being of the people who are paid to work there. If you've thought about being a financial supporter of prison care in the past, but haven't made a donation because it sounds like there's little need, I mean, each compassion team is self-supporting. So the overhead for coordinating a nonprofit like this one is low. That's part of what we love about the prison care compassion team model. But I'm suggesting that you rethink your involvement financially. There is another whole layer to Prison Care Incorporated's work, a layer beyond what the podcast has shared in its first six months of episodes. As our reach is growing, we are being invited to more and more university settings where the bright minds that will be tasked with creating a new system in just a few short years need to be helped to understand on a deep level that us versus them must be removed from the model. As a society, we must care for everyone who exists in a prison neighborhood. As the next generation studies and dreams and devises a plan, we must help them understand how much everyone on the inside matters. And I'm just being real, traveling to campuses, presenting, sharing free resources, etc., gets expensive fast. We're working on creating more and more video resources online that will be accessible for free as time goes on but that takes huge numbers of hours, so it's a slow process. And to be honest, there is no substitute for an in-person event where you interact with one another in real life, travel to universities, conferences, civic groups for live dialogue. That's gonna be a continuing part of our rhythms at Prison Care Incorporated. You see it now, don't you? The need 
it's urgent. The national crisis in the industry is not far off. The answer includes prison care's core tenant, that us versus them serves no one well. And you can help. If you want to learn more, visit prisoncare.org, where you can learn lots about our 501c3 tax-exempt nonprofit organization, what it's doing, and how people all over the country, and in fact, we're beginning to get some international attention as well, are linking arms to help. Consider investing in something you believe in, like prison care. We're equipping compassionate people to support positive prison culture because everyone on the inside matters. Thanks for thinking big picture with me, friends, and thanks for caring. <laughs>